Chapter Twenty One of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Twenty One, An Offer. Kate rose to a sitting posture and drew her feet under her, rested one hand on the rock, and with the other screened her eyes from the glare of the sun, to observe the intruder on her solitude. Then she recognized Roger Redmore. He was without his coat, an axe over one shoulder. In his right hand he held a tuft of cotton grass dug up by the roots. I knowed as you were here, said he, but I durstn't speak before others, lest they should find me out who I wore. Are you living here, Roger? I be working here at the felling brimps oaks. You see, your feyther, he's so little at Coombe that he don't know me, and I thought I might get money by working here, and I want you to do a little job for me. What is it, Roger? There's two jobs. First, do you see this here root of white shiny grass? Well, I want you to take it to Coombe, and to set it on my little maid's grave. Stick the roots in. It may grow, and it mayn't. Hereabouts it groweth mostly in wetland. But anyhow's, by it I shall know where the little maid lies when I come back to Coombe. You are returning, Roger? Not by day. I reckon some night I shall be back just for an hour or so, and I want, when I does come, to go to the churchyard and find out at once where my darling lieth. If it be moonlight, or dummets, twilight, and I see the little silver tuft glitter above her head, and then I shall know where her be. I can't go with me wife. That would be telling folks I were home again. I mun go by myself. Whereabouts now have they put her? By the wall, where the cedar is, on the east side. There'll never be no headstone there, observed Redmore. But what o' that? When once I know where her lieth, Sure but I'll put a fresh new tuft of silver tassels, as oft as the old ones die. And I reckon they'll die, not being in a wet place. My little maid's grave won't be wet, say with her father and mother's tears. And her father, he can't be there but on the sly, and now and then. I will do it for you gladly, said Kate. When do you think you will be home? Home, repeated Roger. I've no home, not like to have. My wife and my little ones, wherever they be, that's all the world to me, and I can't see them but at night, and very chancy, when I don't think nobody's about, and to other thing be this. Roger put his hand into his pocket and drew forth some coin and gave it to the girl. Take this to my old woman. I've earned we me work a bit of money, and here is what I can send her. Tell her to leave the door ajar. I may come any night. But, he paused, I reckon they've turned her out of house and home now. Not yet, Roger, answered Kate. Mr. Pook has not insisted on her leaving at quarter day, but I believe he has a fresh workman coming to him in a week, and then she will have to leave. And where will she go? Will they drive her into the street? I really don't know. But, she considered, and said timidly, I have had it on my heart, but have been afraid to speak of it as yet to my father. There is his cottage, never or hardly ever occupied. Now I will take courage, and beg him to let your wife go into it till something can be settled. But you must keep out of danger, and you are not safe here. I cannot go far till my wife and little ones are secure and have a home. Here no one knoweth me. The other woodcutters are all men from the moor. There was but your father, and he did not recognize me when I axed him to take me on at felling the timber. I will entreat him to allow your wife and children to go into his house till something can be done for them. You will have to escape into another part of the country. Aye, I will go. If I were took, it would go bad with us all and there'd be the shame on my little ones, that their father were hanged. They'd never shake it off. Then he touched Kate on the head. 
My hand be but a wicked un. It have set fire to a rick. But it be the hand o a haunted man, as nigh crushed with sorrows, as would drove to wickedness thro his sufferings, and have bitter repented it since, and swears he'll never do it again, so help me God. He raised his hand solemnly to heaven. That's one thing I ha learned, as doin wrong never brings matters right. There war just that gittin drunk. Then there war the cheek to farmer Pook. Then my heart war all wormwood, and when my little maid died, I thought it war his doing, and so in a way it war, for I'd no work and no wage, and us just about starvin, and I did that deed o fire. It's kindled a fire in here, he touched his heart, that no think can quench. The Lord ha pity on me. I don't know as I'd ha come to this mind but for you, little Kitty alone, and was pitiful to me when I were bounded and like to be given over to jail, and you let me go and fed me with crumbs out of your hand, and now you will find a house for my dear ones. He laid his hand on her head again. Maybe the Lord o l l hear a sinful thief o r a man, and I ax his blessing on thee, and if I can ever do anything to show you I'm thankful, I will. Amen. Ha! Roger Redmore started. He was caught by a hand in his collar band. Kate sprang to her feet. Her uncle, Pasco Pepperill, was there. He had come up from behind unobserved and had laid hold of the incendiary. I have you, you burning vagabond, shouted he, and by heaven, I'll hand you over to the constables and see you hanged as you deserve. Kate, run away, away at once. Oh, uncle, don't be cruel. Let him go. You mind your business, answered Pasco sharply. It's my belief you let him escape after Jan Pook had bound him in the boat. Jan left you in charge, and Roger slipped away then. But think, uncle, of his poor wife and children. With a sudden wrench, Roger freed himself, and then, standing back with brandished axe, he said, Touch me, and I'll split your head. Get away from here, ordered Pasco, turning to his niece. And as for you, Redmore, I want a word. You know very well that if I give the hue and cry, you will be caught, even though now you have slipped from me. Lower your hatchet. I'm not going to hurt you if you be reasonable, but wait till that girl is out of earshot. Pepperell put his hands into his pockets and watched Kate as she withdrew. Roger assumed an attitude of wariness. He was ready at a moment's notice to defend himself with his axe or to take flight. Look here, said Pasco, satisfied that he could not be overheard. It seems to me that you, With your head almost in the noose, have done a wonderful silly thing to stay so near the scene of your crime. I'd my reasons, as is not for you to know, answered Redmore, surlily. I'm sure you don't consign yourself for me and mine so as to care. There you are mistaken, said Pasco. I don't mean to say that I'm deeply interested in you, but I don't intend, unless driven to it, To take any steps to get you acquainted with Jack Ketch. I can defend myself pretty well, suppose you do. I'm not the fool to risk my head in another man's quarrel. And I can take my heels and find a hiding place anywhere on these moors. Ay, and a starving place where your bones will rot. What have you to say to me? Redmore spoke surlily. Now that his whereabouts was discovered, It would be needful for him to shift his place of refuge. I suppose you don't deny setting fire to Farmer Pook's rick, said Pasco. Roger shrugged his shoulders and jerked his head. How did you do it? Smoking a pipe under the tree when drunk? No, it warn't. How was it, then? I warn't drunk, neither but that once, and that were just because o Jackson's t e d o m I've a bit of an organ in Zingen, and the innkeeper he wore terrible longing to have me in the choir. So he got me in, and they tried to teach me the tenor part o Jackson's t e d u m and I couldn't meister it no ways. And they stood more liquor, and I tried, and I couldn't do naught with it. 
Ye see, to other parts went curling up and about, and it bothered me. If they'd a stopped and let me zing alone, I could ha' done it. Then I went out into the open air, and it were cold and frosty, and somehow I got mazed with the drink and the tea dom together, and I rained against my maester, Farmer Pook, and I reckon I zed what I ought not, and he turned me off. That were it. I never did it avore, and I'll never do it again. Save and preserve me from liquor and Jackson's tea dom. Never mind about that. So you didn't fire the rick with your pipe? No, I didn't. If it had never been for Jackson's tea dom, I'd not now be in risk of being hanged. Of course, it was Jackson did it all, sneered Pasco. I don't mean to say that. It were the beginning on it. I were throwed out of work and were starvin, and my little maid, her died, and then I wore like a mazed chap, and I ran out with the candle, and so I did it. Oh, with the candle? It were a rush light. I've heard of barns and storehouses being set fire to by men going into them to sleep and lighting their pipes. There was the landlord of the Crown and Anchor at Newton. He had a miserable sort of a house, but a tramp got in one night. What, into his house? No, into a linhay over the pigsty, and slept there, or went there to sleep, and there was straw in the loft, and in smoking his pipe he managed to set fire to the straw, and then the whole public house was in a blaze and burnt down. I have heard of that. Nobody knows what became of the tramp. There were roast pig found in the ashes, and whether roast tramp nobody cared to inquire. The inn has been rebuilt. They call it a hotel now. I dare say they does. The insurance money did that. I suppose so. Lucky the house were insured. I wish Varmer Pook had been. You do? I reckon I does. I am sorry for what I did when I wore in a bile and blue rage. Now I can't get over it no ways, and you may tell in so. Why, that fire was the making of the landlord. He feels no ill will against the tramp. What are you going to do with yourself now? I don't know. I suppose you will want to see your wife again? I suppose I shall. For that you will return to Coombe? In course I must. At night, lest you should be seen. Aye, to be sure. You will lurk about, be in hiding. I tell you what, I'm your good friend. I will do you no harm. I'll just leave the door of my stores open, unhasped. And if you want to creep in, there's a lot of wool and other things there. You can be warm there, Roger, warm in the wool. Thank ye, sir. You'll not peach. And if, if you like a pipe, well. No, Mr. Pepperell, I won't do you that ill turn if you're so good to me. And the little maid, Kitty, too. Oh, I did not mean that. I can't say but if a spark chanced to fall among the wool, and the hole was to blaze away, I should be sorry. I can't say that I should be troubled, any more than the landlord at Newton, when the tramp set fire to his linhay over the pigs. Redmore said nothing. Pepperell spoke slowly, and did not look the man in the face as he spoke. If the chance was to happen to me, as happened to the man at Newton, it might, there's no saying, be a saving of me from a great misfortune, and I shouldn't mind being a liberal friend and helping you out of the country. That is what you mean, is it? It might be a convenience to both of us. "'Tis a wonderful world,' exclaimed Redmore. "'When the biggest rascals go free, and one of them be you. "'A little rascal like me, who's sorry that ever he done wrong, "'is chived like a mad dog. "'Well, what do you say?' "'You're a rascal, and I despise you,' cried Roger, and turned to go. "'Will you have me as your friend or your enemy?' "'Your enemy rather than friend on them terms. "'Then I'll hang you,' exclaimed Pasco, "'and set off running in the direction of Brimps. 
End of chapter 21